everyone so yeah i just decided to go live what the heck never done this before but it should be entertaining at the very least so yeah let me just continue with this presentation from where i left off uh, it'll save me from having to do this and then retype it i mean sorry edit it i ended off with some of the uh Descriptions of Mutawatir and of course the Mashur Hadith. So let's look at Ahad Hadith. Ahad Hadith in the science of tradition are traditions from a relatively small number of transmitters, one to two, not enough to make them Mutawatir. In at least one point in the chain, it is narrated by less than three people. Now, two narrators are sometimes called an Aziz narration. Now also, these Ahad Hadith are not used for judging what is Fad, or what is haram in matters of belief. Haram obviously is what is legal and what is illegal, right? So fard means what is obligation, what is obligatory. So fard al-ayn means a personal obligation. Fard kifaya means a, an obligation that falls upon the ummah, the Muslim community. So fard al-ayn, for instance, is that you have to do the five daily prayers. This is something that you are compelled to do because it is your responsibility as a Muslim. But something like jihad, this is fad kifaya. A small minority of Muslims is compelled to do it because if no one does, then the sin of non-performance falls upon the entire Muslim community and they all are guilty of sin and they all risk going to hell. Now, if a hadith is a had, but all scholars are unanimous about its authenticity, then this hadith is reliable. I'm just going to shift this over so I can actually see this and see if there's a chat going on. All right, now, the majority of hadith are ahad. In other words, the majority of hadith are considered to be a case of broken telephone. Just muting this tab. I just decided to do this on the fly. So understand the majority of hadith are ahad. They have too few narrators to make them mutawatir. Let's continue. Now you've got some extra categories of hadith. You've got mustafid, maudu, matruk, and matruh. Matruk's interesting. Muslims claim that Khadija, Muhammad's first wife, was 40 years old when he married her. The simple fact is, no, she was not. The age range that she's given is anything from 25 to 46. The most commonly accepted age by the scholars is 25. For the simple reason that apparently she bore Muhammad six children. So how in a 6th, 7th century desert environment does a 40-year-old woman have six children she'd be 50 when she's having children this is not even today medically this is not something that we expect to happen so the hadith or the narrations that describe the age of Khadija these are considered matruk in other words rejected they are rejected by the scholars now Mustafid <coughs> in the science of hadith tradition treated as an intermediate class between Ahad and Mashur Maudu is fictitious the worst type of hadith Right, this is where someone simply fabricated a hadith. Matruk is rejected in hadith. It's a tradition from a single transmitter who is suspected of falsehood or is openly wicked or is guilty of much carelessness or frequent wrong notions. I didn't write that. I'm just saying what the book says. Matruk is a rejected tradition held by some to be synonymous with the tradition that is matruk, but others to be a separate class of traditions less acceptable than da'if but not as bad as maudu. Maudu, of course, and these are different spellings, I left those in deliberately to see how these things change, but Maudu Hadith are fictitious. Da'if is weak. We'll get to that a little later. Now, Hadith chains. When looked at individually, some chains may be considered weak. A narrator can be trustworthy, but he has a weak memory. Multiple chains can corroborate each other, reducing risk of reliability. So, let's continue. Uh, just let me know in the comments if in the chat if i am if you guys can hear me because that'll be interesting that everything's coming through as it should so now understand that hadith can abrogate hadith it is very possible for hadith to abrogate hadith and hadith also abrogate the quran now you might know this guy over here very familiar guy he's known as yasir qadi and he's the guy that recently admitted there were holes in the narrative and due to him we now have discovered people who've made holes in the quran now, this is his book, An Introduction to the Sciences of the Qur'an by Abu Ahmad Yasir Qadi. So this man is highly qualified to speak on, this, on the issue. Of course, when he disagrees with the, 
YouTube comment is um, suddenly he's not a real Muslim, right? So anyway, now let's step forward. Now in his book we find these revelations. Allah has the right to abrogate any command that originated from him either in the Quran or through the tongue of his prophet. So in other words, the hadith which record the sayings and the actions of the prophet Muhammad, these are able to abrogate the Quran. So understand, the Quran can be superseded, countermanded by hadith. Let's go on. He tells us there are four logical scenarios. Nask or Nasik is abrogating. So in other words, there are four logical scenarios of abrogation with regards to the sources of Nasik and Mansuk. Nasik, the abrogating and the abrogated, what was erased what is no longer and what replaced it the nasik right so the quran is able to abrogate the quran so newer verses of the quran can abrogate previous verses the quran can abrogate the sunnah so obviously the quran can abrogate something that's part of the oral tradition of muhammad but of course the sunnah can abrogate the quran and notice it says here a mutawatir hadith can abrogate the quran this man has a PhD in Islamic studies. I, I assume he knows what he's talking about. And the Sunnah can abrogate the Sunnah. So Hadith can abrogate Hadith. Bear this in mind. There's been a lot of debate and discussion around it. But this is not the only source where I found this. But Hadith are able to cancel the Quran. Understand? Which means that Hadith often are far superior to what he said in the Quran. The Quran, when they throw that at you, that's just... It could be garbage. Now, understand that abrogation according to the scholars of Islam, fixed Muhammad's errors. Okay? Abrogation is apparently not Allah changing his mind. Abrogation is designed to fix the errors that Muhammad made in the Quran. So let's read through this man here. Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali considered the most eminent Muslim thinker, scholar, practitioner, mystic, and philosopher of Islam. This is the most highly regarded scholar of Islam after Muhammad himself. He's unanimously accepted as the 5th century Hijri Mujaddid, or centennial renovator of religion. His works were so highly acclaimed by his contemporaries that he's the only Muslim to be called the Hujjat al-Islam, Islam's foremost authority, the proof of Islam. And we are busy speaking of the proofs of Islam. This man is considered the proof of Islam. His arguments were so decisive, and that's his most known name, so that's his title. Remember, there are 28 or so Sheikh al-Islam. These are main scholars of Islam. They're 28 through the last 1400 years. This man stands above them. He's a mujadid, a renewer of the faith. According to the prophetic hadith, one appears once every century to restore the faith of the ummah, the Islamic community. Al-Ghazali in his works, blah, 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 the incoherence of the philosophers and the criterion of action and the alchemy of happiness rejected and refuted, supposedly, the philosophy of Ibn Sina demonstrated that Aristotelian ethics and logic is incompatible with Islamic ethics and reasoning. Understand, we're dealing with a different worldview. They reject Aristotelian logic. They reject Christian and Aristotelian ethics. This is not the same morality that we are familiar with. This is not the same thinking. They don't believe that what we think is logic is logical. Understand? Different culture, different thinking. We are on two different worldviews here. He wrote the most read Islamic spiritual work after the Quran, the Ikhya Ulam al -Din. Now, that's an interesting read. I mentioned some of that in one of my, my previous show with Thaddeus about the escalation of violence in Sharia, which, is, which explains, in that book, it explains how and why the Islamic apologists have all been melting down. Now, let's understand it. Abu... Okay, sorry. Al-Ghazali's words that the prophets are not immune to errors in judgments... Abu Hamid al-Ghazali wrote in his, whatever that is, translated into English by blah 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 under the name Deliverance from Error, said, <coughs> the prophets and religious leaders, the prophets and religious leaders referred men to exercise of personal judgment and necessarily so, despite their knowledge that men might make mistakes. The Apostle of God even said, and that's the Apostle of Allah of course, I judge by externals, but Allah undertakes to judge the hearts of men. This means I judge according to the most probable opinion resulting from witness statements. 
but they may err about the matter, they may be wrong. The prophets had no way to be safe from error in such cases involving personal judgments. How then can anyone else aspire to such safety? Now, it is not uncommon in Islamic texts for them to cite a work, a hadith, and provide absolutely no, no reference. You just don't know. But you'll find that these comments are everywhere across scholarly writings, in the tafsir, in various scholarly works, you name it, all over the place. So they say, he claims, that this was said by Muhammad. The prophets had no way to be safe from errors, so then how can anyone else? So comment, Al-Ghazali wrote this in refutation of the Shia who say that there must be an infallible imam at every time to know the truth. Al-Ghazali explained that the prophet used his personal judgment in judging between people and he was not free from error in it. Al-Ghazali explained these matters in detail that prophets can make errors in judgment. Now there's an additional slide to this. I'm going to skip that slide for the simple reason that I'm going to be doing a full show on Saturday and this is from another scholar that expands upon this and simply bluntly states Muhammad made mistakes Muhammad forgot things Muhammad recited things incorrectly and abrogation was designed to cover up these errors to erase them and thus replace them with Allah's correct statements Muhammad made mistakes or in other words the scholars went and edited things afterwards to suit them now this is something that I think is highly relevant. This explains a lot of what happens with these Islamic apologists and these people we find in the comment section who just, yeah, let's play this. That's the effect of demoralization. These people are so heavily indoctrinated, they cannot accept the truth. They cannot listen to the truth. They cannot hear the truth. They will reject the truth. They will fight the truth, even if you show them from their own documentation. Now we're going to step into the Reliance of the Traveler, the Umdat al-Salik. This is the classical manual of Islamic sacred law. This is from Shafi. Now Shafi is the founder of the Shafi school of jurisprudence. He's considered the master architect of Islamic jurisprudence. He is a major scholar. What's interesting is yesterday I spoke with a Muslim who threw him under the bus. Of course, when they start doing that, you know that you are getting too close to something they don't want you to know about. So weak hadith are used in the Sharia on a consistent basis. You'll find it all over the Sharia. They constantly use weak hadith. Now we are effectively told by Islamic apologists that weak hadith are not even weak. They effectively are false. They're effectively invalid. This is absolutely not the case, not according to Islamic scholars. Seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. The meaning of this hadith, though the hadith itself is not well authenticated, meaning being weak, is true. This is not the only case where the Sharia actually utilizes weak hadith. It uses them on a number of occasions and Muslim scholars refer to them fairly often. Oh, skip that point for Saturday. So now the Reliance goes on to say, having discussed lies and forgeries, we must strictly distinguish them from the hadith category called not well authenticated or da'if, literally meaning weak, so termed because of such factors as having a channel of transmission containing a narrator whose memory was poor, one who was unreliable, unidentified by name, or for other reasons. Such hadiths legally differ from forgeries in the permissibility of ascribing them to the Prophet. Weak hadith can be ascribed to Muhammad, and they can be utilized for legislation. They can be utilized for judging things despite the fact that they're weak. Interestingly, these Islamic apologists need to explain if these things are weak, are invalid, are effectively false, as they constantly tell us, why are they still in the canon? Why are they still, why weren't those books taken outside and burned? If Islam is about truth, then why are you holding on to things that are incredibly unreliable or totally false, as they constantly tell us? So no, that's not the case. Weak hadith can be legally. Now notice, I've been saying these jurists, these major scholars of Islam, are not priests. They are lawyers. Lawyers, not priests. 
these hadiths can be legally ascribed. Not religiously, legally. Right. Section W48 of the Reliance, weak hadiths. A weak or da'if hadith is a term for any hadith with a chain of transmission containing a narrator, blah, blah, blah. But weak hadith cannot simply be equated with false. Hi, Mrs. Skull Super. Hey, thanks for stopping by. So yeah, I hope everyone can hear me right that the audio is fine. So now legal information that is connected. So what do we have? Okay, so weak hadith cannot be equated with false. Were this the case, mere analysis of the transmitters would be the universal criterion for the acceptance or rejection of particular rulings of hadith. While scholars do use this measure in upgrading the work of preceding generations of legal authorities, they have not employed it as a simplistic expedient to eliminate every piece of legal information that is connected with the weak hadith because of various considerations. One of these is that when a piece of information is received through a means of transmission that may or may not be trustworthy, we generally have doubts about it. But when one and the same piece of information reaches us through several completely different channels, even though each one may or may not be trustworthy, the logical probability of the information's falsity is much reduced. And if we receive the very same piece of information from 10 such channels, the possibility of its falsity does not usually even come to mind. Earlier we saw 25, now we have 10. It varies, depends on the quality of the transmitter, supposedly, or the criticality of the issue at hand. But notice that when they say it's weak, it could be coming from multiple, multiple channels. So technically, it's, you could say that's mutawatir. However, the channels contain someone who has a faulty memory, a weak personality, known to lie, etc. So these factors are balanced out, and that potentially mutawatir hadith is now considered weak. It is not considered false because it is ample amplified by multiple different channels multiple different people so yeah we're being lied to by either very ignorant or very dishonest islamic apologists in the youtube comments i wish they would read their own sources this verificatory principle has two important implications one being the obligatory nature of belief in hadiths that are mutawatir so it is obligatory for a muslim now remember sunni sunni muslims sunni comes from sunnah the people of the sunnah the people who believe in the Sunnah of Muhammad, who follow the way of Muhammad. This is Sunnah, what we're seeing here. These hadiths are obligatory. So if a, <laughs> if a hadith is mutawatir, it, it is obligatory for a Muslim to believe it. And the second one, that the weight that hadith scholars give to multiple means of transmission, which can raise a hadith from well-authenticated Hassan to rigorously authenticated Sahih, or from weak to well-authenticated we learned in the previous set of pages that scholars have ongoing studies and they might find that, hold on, wait, there's something, there's a change in this transmission, suddenly a hadith changes classification, goes up. So, a hadith can be raised from Hassan to Sahih or from weak da'if to well-authenticated, as described in the following account of a hadith's reclassification by a major speci specialist in hadith forgeries. I'm not going to read that, but just understand, it is valid, this is the case, right? This is what happens in Islam. Another reason why weak hadith cannot simply be equated with false, cannot be equated with false. And um, yeah, they are plenty. We know them. We know their names. They, they comment all the time. And yeah, they lie to us. Or as I said, they're either extremely ignorant or completely dishonest. Weak cannot be equated with false is the fact that the weak is an attribute of the hadith's chain of transmission, while false is an attribute of the text. Right? So in other words, the text itself could be completely trustworthy but the chain of transmission is weak so that's going to affect how they grade this hadith so these are two different things and they view that as a probabilistic expectation of how to grade that thing and yeah they speak of their four logical possibilities for any hadith so now back to the sharia law sharia law is the talmud of is of islam really um so yeah the muslim Talmud is the Sharia. Thus, when the person who has related a hadith is an Islamic scholar of the first rank, it is not enough for a student or popular writer to find one chain of transmission for the hadith that is weak. No, you have to go through the scholars. There are a great many hadiths with several chains of transmission and adequate scholarly treatment of how these affect a hadith's authenticity that have been traditionally held to require a master, Hafiz. So in other words, 
these guys can't just make up their minds. We've got to go through the masters, and the masters have already done their job, right? A Hafiz, like Bukhari, Muslim, Dahabi. We've never heard of some of these guys, even Kathir, right? Or Siyuti, who have memorized at least 100,000 hadiths, their texts, change of transmission, and significance to undertake the comparative study of the hadith's various change of transmission that cannot be accurately assessed without such knowledge. Today, when one hadith master, Hafiz, remains in the Muslim, when not one, sorry, there, there are no longer Hafiz masters, no longer hadith masters in the Islamic community, we do not accept the judgment of any would-be reclassifiers of hadith, no matter how large their following, unless it is corroborated by the work of previous hadith masters. Hopefully that clarifies so again, we should not be taking these idiots in the comments to take their views seriously. I don't know why anyone does. By the way, scholars of Aditha called Mahadatin. So yeah, JC, the reliance of the travelers from the Shafi'i school. Yeah, that, that is correct. And Shafi'i is considered the master architect of Islamic fiqh. The master architect. So he was the first to take the ideas of fiqh and actually write them out in his, um, it's called the Risala. He actually is now regarded as the as the founder of the of the school of fiqh, usul al fiqh, the risala, that was his that was his construction, and so he's the founder of that. So even though he founded the school, there are two scholars that came after him that are considered more more famous, who built upon his work and others built upon his work and founded the other three schools. But Nawawi, for instance, supersedes him. So the tafsir of hadith or hafiz of hadith. So hafiz was a term used for scholars of hadith, specifically one who had committed one hundred thousand hadiths to memory. Now we're talking about the Tafsir Sahih Bukhari, the Fat al-Bari. As we know, we've got Tafsir of the Quran, right, which are scholarly discussions, scholarly exegesis of Quran verses. This is also true for all of the Hadith. This man here who wrote this book did exegesis of each of Bukhari's Hadith. The most important of all Hadith collection is al Jamia Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, gauged by the fact that at least 70 commentaries have been written on the site. Now, the most celebrated tafsir of Bukhari, right, is without question the magnificent Fat al-Bari, the victory of the creator by Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. And he is also not just an imam, he is a sheikh al-Islam, one of the 28 most highly regarded scholars of Islam. Only 28 scholars roughly have been given that title over the last 1400 years. Only one scholar stands above them, and that, of course, is al-Ghazali. So, JC says the fiqh is, is hinged to Sharia law. They issue the fatwa decrees on how to pray. That are now, understand that the, the Sharia is the Talmud of Islam. Right? It's the Islamic Talmud. So you've got the Torah, you've got the Quran, then you've got the, the Mishnah, the oral traditions, then you've got the Hadith, and so on. So then you've got the, you've got the Halakha, and you've got the fiqh. That's where they have explained and then expanded the laws of Islam in the Sharia, right, and the fiqh. So, rather, the 613 mitzvot of Judaism, that would be your Sharia, effectively, something like that. These are the, what are the rules we can derive from the Torah, right? And by the same token, what can we derive from the Hadith and the Quran? That's your Sharia. And how do we express that in law, in life? That's the fiqh. So, appreciated by the ulama scholars for the doctrinal soundness of its, soundness of its author, complete coverage of Bukhari's material, mastery of the relevant Arabic sciences, the wisdom it shows in drawing lessons, and its skill in resolving complex disputes over variant readings. So this man was highly regarded. This is his book here, Tafsir Sai Bukhari. Remember I said in the beginning, this was written, compiled, this translation was done by Al-Azhar University and Medina Munawara, which are the two highest regarded. These are the two most important Islamic universities and seminaries in the world couple of words on Bukhari, so we have a few more slides to go. And Al-Bukhari said to have questioned more than a thousand scholars of Hadith who lived in places as far apart as Nishapur, Hijaz, Egypt, and Iraq. He used to seek aid in prayer before recording any Hadith and weighed every word he wrote with scrupulous accuracy. I'm just putting this for some biographical background. So he devoted more than a quarter of his life to the compilation of his Sahih, generally considered by Muslims as an authority second only to the Qur'an. Al-Bukhari's notion to compile the Sahih owned its origin, owed its origin to a casual remark from Isaac ibn Rahawi, who said that he wished that a Hadith scholar would compile a short but comprehensive book containing the genuine Ahadith only, 
The hadith is plural of hadith. So he sifted through all the hadith known to him, tested their genuineness according to canons of criticism that he personally developed. He selected 7,275 out of 600,000 hadith and arranged them according to their subject matter under separate headings, most of which are taken from the Quran and in some cases from the hadith themselves. So Bukhari, however, nowhere mentions what canons of criticism he applied to the traditions to test their genuineness nor does he tell us why he compiled the book the way he did. So his is the most famous, the most respected, the soundest of these collections, which are considered the proofs of Islam, the proofs of Muhammad's prophethood. But people don't really know what he did, how he did it, etc. So many later scholars try to infer from the text itself. Hazmi and others in their commentaries and many other writers on these scientists, including even Salah, they tried to deduce Abu Khari's principles from the material he presented. Now, he chose hadith that were handed down from the Prophet on the authority of a well-known companion via a continuous chain of narrators according to his records, research, and knowledge. And these were hadith that had been unanimously accepted by honest and trustworthy scholars as men and women of integrity, possessed of a retentive memory and firm faith, and accepted on condition that their narrations were not contrary to what was related. A hadith from other reliable authorities free from defects. So he would take hadith from other authorities as well, as long as they were considered free from defects. I think if you look at these kinds of um, conditions that he set here, these criteria that he set, these could well be subjective. I mean, really, how does one know? So Al Bukhari concludes in his work the narrations of these narrators, when they explicitly state that they had received the hadith, he, sorry, he includes in his work the narrations of these narrators when they explicitly state that they had received the hadith from their own authorities. How do you know it's right? We don't. In their statement in this regard, so if their statement sorry, was ambiguous, he took care that they had demonstrably, demonstrably met their teachers and were not given to careless statements. Now on to Askalani, last two or three slides. From the above principles, which Imam Bukhari took as his guide in choosing his materials, his caution is evident. Now these are the arguments taken straight out of the book that I just showed you earlier. So I'm just quoting passages out of the book. Abu Bukhari's purpose was not only to collect what he considered to be sound hadith, but to impress the contents on the minds of his readers and to show them what doctrinal, doctrinal and legal inferences could be drawn from them. So understand that we're creating doctrine. We know very little about Islamic doctrine. There are doctrines that describe things. So this is something that I'm trying to bring to light so people can understand the structure of Islam and Islamic thinking and law. He divided his work into more than 100 books, which he'd subdivided into 3,450 chapters. Every chapter has a heading that serves as a key to the contents of the various traditions, which it includes. Now, apparently at the age of 12, he was competent enough to lead the prayers in the holy city, where he spent much time studying in this, in this house of Kharubi, called the Bayt al-Aina, whose windows apparently looked directly upon the black stone. In Cairo, he wrote some of his most thorough and beneficial books, ever added to the Library of Islamic Civilization. So, yeah, blah, blah, blah. He died in 852. His funeral was attended by 50,000 people, we are told, including the Sultan and the Caliph, and apparently even the Christians grieved. We considered him a great, great scholar, whatever. Now, we want to clarify some vocabulary. A Sheikh al-Islam is an honorific title for outstanding scholars of the Islamic scientists, sciences given to jurists whose fatwas were particularly influential. I just need to scroll down here so I can see what the comments are. Right. And was in the classical era reserved for ulama and mystics. Now, as I said, 28 scholars aside received this title. Ulama means scholar, right? Literally the learned ones. And these people are considered the guardians, the transmitters, and the interpreters of religious knowledge in Islam, including Islamic doctrine and law. And very little has been discussed on the internet about Islamic doctrine, at least in an easily absorbed format, which I'm trying to change. Now, notes about the translation, last two slides. They talk about the methodology of the translators. Oh, JC says, Bukhari weeded out thousands of hadiths to four or five thousand. Yeah, I gave the, the number a little earlier. And Muslims can't really overcheck what Bukhari filtered. It's basically Bukhari's collection correct. So the translation of hadith from one to thirty of Fat al-Bari was done by students of knowledge studying in both Medina and Al-Azhar. This is the methodology they employed in translating the hadith from Fat al-Bari. 
we will be translating the meaning of the explanation rather than translating the explanation verbatim. So they're doing a retranslation and they're giving a paraphrase effectively. Hey, Gospel Edge, how are you doing? Right, so we will be translating the meaning of the explanation rather than translating the explanation verbatim. We will exclude anything that we deem irrelevant for the English reader. Hmm. And beginner level student of knowledge, such as in depth discussion of language related issues or issues surrounding the narrators. Any narrations that Ibn Hajar himself classifies as weak will be removed from the translation. And here we're on to the final two slides. Now, removing weak hadith from the work was not the example of the scholars, otherwise, Imam Ibn Hajar would not have included them himself in Fatal Bari as sources to take knowledge from. What they're saying is weak hadith, removing those from their works, is not the example of the scholars. The scholars use weak hadith, else they would have done so themselves, and they say that these are sources to take knowledge from. Weak hadith are used to support opinions because a weak hadith containing the words of the Prophet is preferred over pure opinion and personal judgment. Read that again when you have a moment. So weak hadith are preferred over pure opinion and personal judgment, especially when they can contain the words of Muhammad. This is the example set by all the scholars, including Imam Bukhari, who used them deliberately in his work Al-Adab al-Mufrad. The Sahih of Imam Bukhari is a collection of the Sahih only, specifically, not a collection of the only hadith that scholars use. So he restricted himself purely to what was considered Sahih. The scholars themselves state a Sahih hadith has about a 99 to 100% chance of being entirely accurate. I'd say the chances of being entirely accurate is roughly between zero and zero, but yeah, that's just me. Now, the scholars themselves say that a Sahih hadith has 99 to 100% chance of being entirely accurate. A Hassan hadith has about an 85 to 99% chance of being entirely accurate. A Da'if hadith has about a 45 to 85% chance of being entirely accurate. And this is the widest band of accuracy. Even a fabricated hadith has a 45% chance of being accurate. Since the grading it was given, and this is very, very important to understand, the grading it was given may have been wrong or the fabricator may have spoken the truth in this instance. So weak hadith should not be treated like fabricated hadith because an 85% chance of being entirely accurate is a very high chance. This is not me writing this. These are the scholars from the two top Islamic seminaries in the world. If a person received 85% on his test scores, would he throw that out? That's the very good question. Would he throw that out? Right? Would he throw that out saying, this isn't worth anything? Each hadith is treated individually. There is no such thing in Islam as banning an entire grade of hadiths from being used. Hopefully this answers the dishonest commenters or the ignorant commenters, the Islamic apologists in the YouTube comment section. No, just because it's weak, your scholars actually consider them relevant. They're in the Sharia. They are legal. They can be used in the Sharia. They can be used in the fiqh. So even fabricated hadith are still studied because one scholar may grade it fabricated while another may grade it sahih. And there are many famous examples among the scholars of this occurring. And that's the end. Yeah. So yeah, look, I, mean, I just decided to off the cuff just do this and uh, finish this so that I can have this video online. And uh, yeah, any questions from anyone? Because that is the end. And yeah, and thanks all for watching. I do appreciate the support and the discussion. I learn a whole lot from you guys, honestly. It, it, it's actually, you'd be amazed how much your commentary helps me. It, it, man, you guys give me clues, you give me hints, you teach me things. It's been very, very helpful. And hopefully, if you can let me know, how does this help you? And uh, you know, how can we take this forward to you know take the fight back with you guys so that we can show them the truth? Yeah, JC, you're welcome. I'm just gonna. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Vertisamo. Much appreciated. 
Uh, much appreciated. How do you guys use this information? I mean, how do you apply it? Because I was really tired of, of seeing all the lies in the comment section. I want to be able to speak to these guys and tell them, look, these are the facts of Islam. I wasn't finding this anyway, so I went to do it myself. And I can refute them now because I know the Sharia so well. I know the fiqh so well. What about you guys? How do you use this? And uh, how do you find it useful? How do you apply it? What do we need to do? You know, what information do we need to start putting out there so that we can, we can show just how dishonest these apologists are? You're welcome, Gospel Age. No, thank you for all the support. Hey, man, we're all fighting the good fight, you know? Um, I don't think we're going to be putting out videos... <laughs> Hello, Dodzer. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think we're going to be putting out videos like some of these crazy uh, Islamic apologists. We're not there. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, yeah, if there's no questions, I'll, give it, I'll leave it open for a minute, just for questions. If none, then I, I'll shut down the stream, because at least now I've read out my presentation. Saturday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 p.m. Warsaw Central Time, Europe um, Central Time. Well, we are, what's it? European Central Time, yeah. I'll be doing a presentation with Thaddeus on his channel, Reason Dancers Apologetics, and we will be discussing this entire presentation live. I've made updates as well in the meantime. Ah, uh, Verita Samo, man, I use those pertinent things all the time and they will deny 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 um Thaddeus will confirm and we've discussed this many times in his live streams I will say look I don't want your opinion show me from the Sharia show me a fix citation give me quote me out of your top scholars books each of them oh you'll go back oh yeah no problem yeah awesome yeah no if you need anything let me know just drop in the comments um maybe I should start making a list available people can download like a word document or a txt document and that might be helpful. That is true. Um, yeah, no, no, JC, that's correct. Yeah, no, we have to start. We are the scholars now. Uh, I tell Muslims that now. We are the scholars now. Remember, they're not allowed to tell us these things. It's illegal for them. Sharia forbids them, and they follow that. I've asked hundreds of Muslims, show me from the Sharia. Show me. Give me a citation. Don't, not your opinion. You claim to follow the scholars. You've got your four schools of fiqh. Which one do you belong to? You tell me. I'll tell you what the Sharia manuals and the fiqh manuals for your school are. And then you quote me out of those books. They won't do it. They absolutely flat will not do it. Correct. And the thing is, they can't. They can't talk about Sharia. It is it is um, kryptonite to them. But it's not allowed. They'd be revealing the secrets and the weaknesses of the Muslims, which is treason under the Sharia. And they're not allowed to reveal anything of Islamic law to anyone who's not trying to convert. We are doing this for, for what they would consider an incorrect purpose, for what they would consider um, to harm Islam. So they can't. They're not allowed to. But yeah, make them stick to the facts. Don't let them run the show. Don't let them dictate the terms. We dictate the terms. I will quote things and they'll say, no, that's wrong. I'll say, okay, show me from the Sharia, your own schools, how I'm wrong. They can't do it. They absolutely can't do it. So yeah, in this case, I think this is a fight that we are easily going to win. I mean, this, seriously, they can't tell me that they outrank the top scholars of the two top Islamic universities in the world, where their top imams are trained. Just not going to happen. Okay, yeah, so uh, so guys, yeah, if that's it, I will start wrapping up the stream. I hope this was interesting. Um, one last question. Should I do occasional Q&As, like go live for half an hour or something, and... Uh, Ah, because of you, I went and downloaded the Reliance and was amazed at the absolute... <laughs> oh, yeah, it's horrible. Yes, very to Samuel. <clears throat> it's terrible. It's slavery. It's, it's, it's a prison. Um, it is a prison. Weird enough, I found myself in the same context as they are, and I can insert missionary speech into the midst. Um, yeah, look, we, we don't hate Muslims, right? I mean, look, sure, I, I make fun of them all the time because they... It's, I mean, man. Um, but, but, yeah, it's better than... Um, you know the, what they do which is go out and threaten people with death um you know making fun of people i don't think is illegal um yeah but look we, we don't hate them you know we really want to help them we're here to help them and i want to teach them what their own scholars say and i need you guys to understand also remember like i said the sharia is the talmud of islam just like the jews are the talmud the sharia is the muslim talmud and we need to start taking it seriously we really the quran and the hadith became the sharia became the talmud the scholars don't need those references they look at their own works from the sharia the fiqh and so on 
that's what they look at. The Quran and the Hadith, those are little toys for the new Muslims, you know, just recent converts, and for the lay Muslims to play with. Those are like little, like, like you give a baby a toy. That's what those are. The real stuff is the reliance, the absolute Sharia. So, okay, so very to sum of the, uh, yeah, I'd love to do some Q&A. So I can maybe like every now and again, just put up a little notice as soon as I figure that out and just do a Q&A. I'll come online, take some questions and try and answer as much as I can, especially because if we're out there in the comments section trying to, you know, trying to school these guys, trying to teach these guys, trying to refute their lies, and yes. Um, so Reliance is from the Shafi school. Shafi is considered the master architect of Islamic fiqh. So he wrote a book on Usul al-Fiqh called the Risal. It's the very first, he was the very first to basically codify all of the Sharia into the fiqh, into the Islamic law. And then of course he inspired everyone else to do that and everyone else built on that foundation and then created the Islamic law as we have it today. So he is considered the very first scholar to do so, and he is a very, very highly regarded scholar. Now, what's interesting is yesterday, a Muslim tried to throw him under the bus. So, of course, when he did that, I figured, okay, I need to go read more into this guy's life, right? Because when they do that, that's a clue that you really need to go and look at what they're trying to deny or deflect from. So the Umdat al-Salik is from the Shafi school. The Shafi school is considered the strictest of the schools. It is also, the Reliance is a single volume, right? It's the Reliance of the Traveler and the Tools of the Worshipper. So, for instance, take the Hadaya, which is 2,652, give or take, pages, four volumes. It'll, it's a stack this high on a desk, right? So it's huge. Whereas the Reliance is a single volume. The original, before it was added to by Keller, is like 600 pages, and you could carry it with you like a little Bible. You could carry it with you, and you could use it. So, yes, it is accurate, right? It's a summary document. So if you need more information, you then go and refer to another book to another scholar's works but it encapsulates all that is relevant so yes it is accurate and if you compare its writings to various other books like the Hedaya for instance for instance the Reliance has maybe I think one page on Jihad you go to the Hedaya and you'll have like 80 pages on Jihad but it expands and confirms everything in the Reliance for argument's sake yeah we can catch them with God as long as we yeah, they don't expect us to know this stuff, but they've become complacent. They've failed to, to educate themselves because we didn't understand. But the fact is now we are learning. We are educating ourselves. We are, we've gotten used to their tricks. We understand their tricks. And the thing is, we're not lying. We're just using their own scholarly works right back at them. And they have no answer for this. And all they can do is deny, 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 lie, lie, lie. It's really sad. It's really pathetic. However, we're also showing other people Right. So, yeah, so there's lots to read. You have no idea how many books they have. Oh, my gosh. It's crazy. It's crazy. I've got a collection of now, like, something like a thousand of these books. It's a cross, man, the, the amount of cross-referencing is insane. So, yeah, if there's no more questions, um, but, yeah, I'd like to do some Q&As now again. So, um, you know, and I can take questions from people and help them and understand what's what. Um, yeah, but hopefully on Saturday, you guys will be in the live stream with Thaddeus on his channel, Reason Dances. See you there. 8 p.m. my time in Europe, in Warsaw, and uh, that should be 7 p.m. UK time, and it's 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's the right coast of America. Okay, yeah, sweet. I've got loads. Of, I've got more than just Cliff's notes, dude. I have a huge, huge database. Everything you ever wanted to know about Islam on every topic of Islam, but we're afraid to ask. I can drown you in documentation. I've extracted everything of relevance. So if a Muslim gives me a hard time on jihad. I have something like three or four thousand authoritative citations. So when he runs out of nonsense on stupid quote number five, I've got 3,995 or more of these to go from their top scholars. I can bury them in their own nonsense. Yeah, from their top scholars. And I mean, there's no way for them to refute it. It's just, yeah, I have too much data. So I'm happy to share that. If you guys want, in the about page of my YouTube account, there's my email address. Just drop me an email if you need anything. I can hook you up. Okay, guys, so yeah, I'm going to call it here. Thank you for joining me on my very first ever live stream. I appreciate it. Uh, I have no idea how many people are actually in the chat. Let me have a look. Hey, wow. <laughs> cool, 10 people. Um, yeah, thank you again for all the support, all the advice. I actually learn a lot from you guys. And um, yeah, we will see you next time, right? Now, now I actually have to figure out how to cancel the live stream. That's, uh, yeah, new to me too. Okay. 
I'll see you guys next time. Have a good one. See you Saturday. Bye.